Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today, uh, helping to create a better tomorrow in the healthcare domain on some really unique fronts and technologies. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Richard Burt, uh, who is a, a Fulbright Scholar, professor professor of medicine at Scripps Healthcare, a uh, tenured retired professor of medicine at Northwestern University, uh, where he served for many years as a chief of uh, immunotherapy and autoimmune diseases, uh, as well as current chief executive officer of Janani Biotechnology. Uh, Dr. Burt, for the last few decades, has endeavored first in animal models, and then, of course, uh, with some very uh, public uh, world's first clinical trials, bringing the field of stem cell and cellular therapy uh, to patients' bedsides. Uh, Dr. Bird has published uh, more than 145, mostly first author uh, articles. He is the also the editor of four medical textbooks. Uh, he was the first uh, autoimmune committee uh, chairperson for the International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry uh, and was the principal investigator of the NIH's $10 million uh, multi-center uh, contract to develop stem cell uh, clinical trials for autoimmune diseases. Uh, Dr. Burt performed uh, America's first uh, hematopoietic poetic stem cell transfer for uh, multiple sclerosis, lupus, Crohn's disease, uh, as well as chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy and stiff person syndrome, and published the world's first randomized clinical stem cell transplant trials for systemic sclerosis and multiple sclerosis. Uh, he has been awarded uh, numerous <laughs> awards, the, uh, the Leukemia Scholar uh, of America, the Lupus Foundation, uh, America Fidelitas uh, Award, the Van Beckham Award for the European Society of Blood and Bone Marrow Transplantation, the Distinguished Clinical Achievement Award by the Clinical Research Forum and the European Group for Blood and Marrow Transplant Clinical Achievement Award. Uh, he has been presented in the Vatican uh, with the keys to the Vatican, was a speaker at the, uh, the Festival of Thinkers and Leadership at Healthcare in the UAE, and chaired the biotech session uh, at the, uh, the Baku Azerbaijan International Humanitarian Forum, and has been recognized extensively uh, by Science Illustrated for uh, accomplishing one of the top 10 medical breakthroughs in the next 10 years, and by Scientific American as one of the top top 50 uh, individuals uh, for improving humanity and outstanding leadership. And uh, aside from all that, he's also now a, uh, uh, his, his new book, uh, Everyday Miracles, Curing uh, Multiple Sclerosis, Scleroderma, and Autoimmune Diseases by uh, Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplant is actually coming out tomorrow, uh, be available on all major booksellers. Uh, check for the, the forward with the Dalai Lama as well. Uh, we're honored to have him with us today. Uh, Dr. Richard Burt, uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. It's it's great having you. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed uh, over the years following your work in this you know fascinating set of domains. I I would really like to start off today. Um, if we look, if we could sort of like start the episode off just discussing autoimmune diseases for a little bit, because you know I I took a look at the numbers um, before. I came on this show, uh, and they're huge. Uh, I think 4% of the world you know, currently suffering from one of these uh, 80 different diseases. Uh, obviously, you know, the public knows the big ones in terms of MS, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, psoriasis, but there's uh, dozens others that make up literally hundreds of millions of people around the world. And, you know, coming out of 
pharma and having worked in the space and sort of knowing the past history of steroids and sort of old school disease modifying drugs and a little bit of, you know, the current area of uh, biologics, we still have a lot of really sick people out there. Uh, talk a little bit about the autoimmune disease space as you look at it in 2023. Well, I think that's a very astute observation. And um, I actually, the last chapter of my book, Everyday Miracles, is titled, Why Can't I Get HSCT Eyes Wide Closed? And the reason I titled that is because I spent 35 years developing this concept, this idea, first 10 years in animal models and basic bench research, learning really immunology, and then the last 25 years uh, developing and doing clinical trials. And despite these clinical trials uh, that have been quite successful, uh, and um, despite uh, you know multiple talks, numerous talks around the world, uh, despite a lot of publications, many people still don't know about this, both yeah. in the medical community as physicians or healthcare providers uh, and patients. And uh, so my patients have said, you know, why aren't institutions and people standing on rooftops shouting about this? And um, that's actually one of the reasons why I decided to do this book, Everyday Miracles, because I wanted to inform lay people, the non-medical people. Yep. But in fact, I think physicians and healthcare providers uh, will definitely enjoy this book as well, be because I described several different autoimmune diseases, as well as these patient stories from the patient's perspective, uh, as well as kind of the development of the field uh, from my own point of view as a pioneer in it, you know, with the idea of develop coming to me about 30 or 35 years ago. So I wanted this to be able to empower patients. And um, I think, you know, I give four reasons in the last chapter why I think despite the success, this hasn't taken off. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those reasons is risk benefit because there is risk in doing a transplant, someone could die. Right. And in fact, uh, the largest registry for these transplants now exists in the EBMT, European, European Bone Marrow, transplant registry and there's I think over 3,000 there and in the early days not with me but with EBMT they had a mortality of around five percent mm -hmm. from all the centers reporting it has to do to many reasons a learning curve and using cancer regimens instead of non-myeloablative immune specific regimens like I've always argued for but anyway that's markedly decreased it's below uh 0.5 percent in the BTM registry now in my own personal hands my last publication of all our MS patients with a non-myeloblative regimen 511 it's 0.2 percent mm -hmm. so there can still be mortality and uh, I think you know there's an old axiom to no harm in medicine and so that has to uh, always be considered. But on the other hand, everything has risk. Every medication has risk. Sure. Even normal saline can kill a patient. And it yeah. has killed my patients with scleroderma because the heart is very stiff. And if you give them normal saline uh, too aggressively, not aggressive by a normal patient's standard, not by, if it was being given to me or you, but to a scleroderma patient, it'll throw them into heart failure and lung failure and, sure. and pass away and that has happened i've seen that so even a bag of water well salt water normal saline that's viewed totally innocuous can and does kill people it has happened so you know everything's both good and bad like a lot of young doctors think all these medications are miracle pills and they can be but they're also all have side effects you know both short term and long term and one of the things i have to repeatedly emphasize when a patient's having a problem first thing to do is look at their list of medications. It is not unusual to find that it's iatrogenic that is induced by doctors giving these yeah. medications. They are all potential toxins. So, you know, how do you treat anybody with anything? Given that scenario, everything's both good and bad. Nothing's 100%. Well, uh, the way is informed consent. So as long as a patient understands all the risks, including in transplant, the difference between non-myeloablative and myeloablative, myeloablative with those cancer regimens, mine are more gentle, non-myeloablative, and by that nature, safer, but not, again, you can't promise totally safe. So sure. the, the key to all this is always informed consent. And kind of the irony of this is when I first started it, 
Ooh, people kind of looked at me like it was too risky. But it was weird because what took off in America are these aggressive cancer myeloblative regimens, which are much more intense and risky and not needed, absolutely not needed that, that level of intensity. So I've been the one arguing for the safer regimens against these more intense regimens, which, by the way, were funded by NIAID, National right. Institute of Allergy and uh, Im uh, immune or infectious disease, uh, which I fought against as one of the original, as the PI on the original study all along saying no. And I had the data and had the animal models. You want to use the safer immune specific, not cancer regimens. And I think with time that'll be recognized and things will shift towards that because if you can get these really good results, why take that extra risk up front? Mm -hmm. Now I think people take the risk because they, some people think that it may be better. Uh, but with such good results, I, I question that. And if you really want to do it, you got to compare the two intense, the myeloblative to non-myeloblative. And you can make non-myeloblative as, as immune intense as a myeloblative without being myeloblative. It's mm -hmm. how you design it. So, But the key is in the conditioning regimen, which gets rid of your old immune system, is kind of like how an astronomer looks at a, a for planets that are habitable in other solar systems because now they're finding them. And so they have to look for that habitable zone. In other words, not too close to the sun, not too far away. If it's too far away, it's too close. If it's too, it's, it's too cold. If it's too close to the sun, it's too hot. And they're not going to support life. So they want that habitable zone. And that's what the conditioning regimen is that you want. You don't mm -hmm. want it too strong. It's too toxic. You don't want it too weak. Uh, you know, it's not going to work. So you have to find that. And that depends that varies by each disease. It's kind of like the habitable zone varies by the intensity of the stars. So these little red dwarfs, the planets have to be a lot closer, right. say around where Mer Mercury is, which is stifling, burning hot for life for a yellow star, but for a red dwarf, it's kind of a nice fit for, for life. Uh, you know, for a you know, we have an average size sun, so our habitable mm -hmm. zone is kind of where most of them are. But for a bigger bl blue star, it has to be further away, somewhere out around Jupiter. So you have to adjust your conditioning regimen by the disease. And there's not one conditioning regimen that fits all. And that's kind of, a, a, in all honesty, kind of a gut instinct and trial and error to do that. But in this book, I describe where we've really figured out an optimal conditioning regimen. And if someone makes it better, all the better for them, but optimal for five diseases, MS, that is multiple sclerosis, systemic sclerosis, which is commonly called scleroderma by patients, uh, neuromyelitis, optica or Devix disease, that's a demyelinating disease, akin to but different from MS, CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is a, uh, a disease of immune destruction of your peripheral nerves, whereas MS involves the spinal yep. cord, brain, CIDP gets your peripheral nerves, not the spinal cord, not the brain. And uh, finally, Crohn's disease, which is a gastroenterology immune mediated disorder. And uh, when I went to write these patients up, because normally we follow and report out to five years, which is actually pretty long. It's compared sure. to drug companies, which report one to two years. So right. uh, that's pretty long in that comparison. And this, there's no pharmaceutical support in what we do. There's no right. patent or license or return of profit in what we do. It's purely an academic uh, altruism to try to uh, improve uh, the health of patients. Yep. Um, but um, um, I think that uh, risk benefit is one of the concerns, but understanding that focusing on non-myeloblative, the right selection of patients and experience center effect will markedly minimize that and diminish it. But of course you can never promise it to be zero. Sure. Um, it, but that's a person's own choice that, you know, you're not living in their shoes and these diseases can be horrible. And one of the things I do in these book is I, t I take individual patient stories mm -hmm. that I developed with them. And initially, I was hesitant to do that. It's kind of like a profile's of courage of patients. But I wanted the human as humanistic aspect to come out right. because when I do publications, it's all statistical and it's dry and it's dull and, you know, the, the human story gets lost. But I wanted that out there. And the best way to do that is give these patient stories. And there's 54 patient stories in here. I wish I could have done more, but they put limits because they say people won't read too big a book. Right. So that's probably true. Uh, but in any event, 
you know, because I'm trained with HIPAA that you can't release information, I obviously got every patient's consent mm -hmm. in writing, and I co-developed it with them and had them proof it at the end to make sure they're comfortable with it. And I asked every patient to use a pseudo name with no last name, a pseudo first name, although if they wanted to use their real first name, they could. And I say that in the introduction, and I say I will not give any more information or uh, deny or acknowledge anything about any of these patients because of my own belief in privacy. That's essential for a doctor-patient relationship. Nonetheless, these patients have all given written consent, all knew their story. They all got an advanced copy of the book. And, uh, you know, the truth is, it's, you know, I've treated so many patients, there'll be a lot of patients disappointed their story isn't in there. And I also regret that each each patient has an incredible story. Um, so uh, going back again to why this is, isn't taking off, besides this concept of risk benefit, there's another big one, really big one. And I mentioned four of them in the book. I'll leave the last two for people who read the book. But the other one I title is homeless. Okay. And the reason for that is I was trained in HEMOC, and I used to transplant leukemias. That's how I got the award as Leukemia Scholar of America. It was a grant and for some gene therapy work and so forth. But yep. um, uh, I had this idea to apply this technology, but to soften it and make it non-myeloblative for autoimmune diseases. I explain in the book how I came up with that idea. And um, the, as I, having been trained in hematology oncology, I had to learn these autoimmune diseases on my own yeah. and develop these protocols. Uh, and I found that people in those individual departments or divisions really weren't interested in this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I self-taught and, but it, you know, you design your protocols. It takes about two years to do it. You have to read all the literature about this disease, all these clinical trials. And in a way you can see them without your mind being already influenced by the general community. For instance, what I found in reading all the studies on MS is that they're approved by the FDA not for improving neurologic disability. They don't do that. Not for improving quality of life. They don't do that. Mm. I bring that out in the book. But because they slow progression of disease, and right. they can slow it usually in the early days by the number of new lesions on MRI, also then later by progression, neurologic progression, not reversing, but slowing it. And then they get the most recent way that people want to look at it is by no evidence of disease activity. That is no clinical text, no MRI progression, no neurologic progression. But it doesn't talk about quality of life and it doesn't talk about reversal of disability. And that's the fundamental thing yeah. transplant does. So we could actually focus on a totally different endpoint and uh, compared to all the drugs. Now, there are some drugs where there's a slight improvement in the SF36, the standard quality of life, by like one to two points. And so then uh, people could argue it does, and they report those. The problem is the minimal change in the SF36 for a patient to appreciate an improvement in their quality of life is five. It has mm -hmm. to be five. For Otherwise, it's just a number, a statistical number. Right. When you do mean in all the patients, it's improved compared to baseline from one by one point. But to pay, an individual patient, that means nothing. They have to have a change of at least five. In our studies, the improvement was 15 to 25 points. So it's, it is real clinical improvement for a patient. Obviously, if neurologic disability reverses, which none of these drugs do, and if you get off drugs, which is the key to this, you do this and you're off all these drugs, you don't need them anymore. Uh, your quality of life improve, improves. Now, it turns out about 23% of patients with non-myeloblative non regimen that I use for MS relapse, but uh, going out to five years, the majority didn't. And in writing this book, because I wasn't telling people, I was contacting patients I treated the longest 21 years ago, 20, 15, more than 10 years ago. Most of the patients in here are that longer follow-up. You know, I just randomly contacted them and wow, they're still in remission. They're getting no treatments. Obviously, they weren't coming back to us. They're not getting MRIs or whatever because they're glad to be free of the medical system, but they're doing great. Yep. They got better. They stayed better. And so I still never use the word cure, even though in the title I use the word cure. I did that to capture people's attention, but I explain in there. I'm always hesitant to because there's no definition of a cure for these diseases. But sure. when you do a one-time treatment and then you go for 10, 15, 20, 21 years, and you have no evidence of any new disease, you got better, it stayed better, maybe we can start thinking that way, or at least we've now changed the natural history of the disease. Yep. And so that's the key. But again, going back to what I was saying, I had to do this on my own. And I call it homeless because 
there is no department or Institute sure. of Autoimmune Diseases. There's no National Institute of Autoimmune Diseases. There's no Autoimmune Disease Institutes in America. And mm -hmm. how can that happen? And the reason that happened is because medicine got put into different division, divisions and departments based on what we could see initially, you know, before technology, before microscopes, you'd do autopsies. Right. And so you could see the skin and that became dermatology. You can see the eyes, ophthalmology. On autopsies, they could see the heart and they figured out how circulation works and heart attacks. So that became cardiology, uh, rhythm disturbances, cardiology. They saw the lungs, they saw the kidneys, nephrology, pulmonology. And then certain diseases were big enough that they became their own board certification and institutes like cancer. Right. Uh, emergency medicine, when I first started, wasn't a separate board certification. Right. Uh, now it is. It became a separate board certification. Radiology became separate. But autoimmune diseases always remained orphaned into these yep. different uh, departments. For vision of the ones I talk in here, MS is in neurology, scleroderma is in rheumatology, and Crohn's is in gastroenterology. Yep. So, and you, I have a nice table in here of over 80 different autoimmune diseases and the different divisions that there are departments that they're put in, in the book, it's saying exactly what you had said is they're kind of homeless. And the right. reason for that is when all these were separated out, you treated by organ, you develop subspecialties by organ system. Nobody had a microscope to study and learn what immune cells are in the blood or what they do. Eventually, as that occurred, they set up immunology departments that did basic research on these immune cells. But that's basic research. The clinical care and clinical trials had already been set into the different divisions and departments. And so, I, you know, they have their own little uh, fiefdoms that are already established. And then it becomes very hard to change that. Uh, and uh, when you come from the outside and you aren't trained in one of those uh, departments or divisions and you're getting these kind of results, it's naturally going to be met with skepticism. And what you're going to have, the, the result is you have people who have the basic knowledge of how to do this coming out of the field of hematology that is transplant of leukemia. Right. But they don't know these diseases. They have, they have no training at all. And then you have people who spend a lifetime training in these diseases, such as neurologists, rheumatologists, gastroenterologists, so forth, that do not know anything about transplant. To them, all transplants are the same. It's some cancer regimen that, yeah. you, you know, markedly sick and, and all this stuff, and it's all myeloblative. And so they're hesitant to refer, refer patients away from to these people not trained in it. People not trained in it don't know the right group of people to take because they're focused and trained in a different disease. So, you know, I call that homelessness. And it, what it really requires is people like me to sub sub specialize, just like transplant for leukemias, lymphomas, myeloma, so forth, is a subspecialty hematology. It does not have its own boards. It's right. hindered by that as well. But it's a subspecialty that people will identify with and focus on. Uh, you know, it's going to require people to do that for these autoimmune diseases. You're going to have to really learn, even though you're a hematologist, you're going to have to really learn these autoimmune dis diseases that you decide to treat. Or there could be a change where the federal government itself asks the NIH to set up an institute of autoimmune disease. Yeah. And then fund centers to bring, as a center, all these different very intelligent, but different uh, departments, divisions together under one center to develop uh, and focus on autoimmune disease, it's not just the basic science, bring in the basic immunology departments, but the clinical care. And uh, that includes having in them divisions of cellular therapy, such as, uh, and there are many types of cellular therapies that will be coming forward in the future. CAR T cells that are used in cancer can be used sure. for autoimmune diseases, but hematopoietic stem cell transplant, like I've shown, because nobody's had these kind of data with any of these drug company trials. Right. And uh, so these are two of the reasons, risk, benefit, and homelessness, that, and there's two more, and I'll leave it for people to get the book to read, that they're well-meaning. Nobody's yep. malicious. It's just the way the system has gotten structured and designed that when combined together significantly retard this development of this field despite it being very, very successful. And uh, so, you know, when, when patient, patients get frustrated, they say, oh, it's the fault of the FDA. It's not. Yeah. 
the FDA actually doesn't regulate regulate homologous application of stem cells. It's a transfused blood product, yeah. you know. So it's not the fault of the FDA, they, uh, and so they have these. It's it, they say it's a drug company's fault, and it's not. I mean, not directly. Drug companies take a lot of financial risk to develop a drug. These drugs we're using are standard generic drugs. No drug company is going to do this for transplant because it's generic. If they do all the expense of a trial, they're not going to be able to monopolize. Somebody else will come in, and so they'll get nothing out of it. Their investors and the people in society invested into it get nothing out of it. So they don't hinder it, but it, it can't. It's there's no financial benefit to them for doing this, so they don't get involved. So it's it's not directly their fault. It's our system, our structure, and I bring that out in the book. So that's kind of a long answer, but no, you know, no, it's uh, you can you know. Unfortunately, the the our national media likes a five second catchphrase. Right. It's not that. It's not hanging a scarlet letter around one person or one group of people. It's our structure that has gotten set up that it requires a little. It requires working in this field to understand that, and that's what I bring out here. Yeah, and I mean, I, the human stories and these patients. Yeah, it's um, you know, having I, I, I it's funny because as I'm listening to your story, because you know, in a uh, in a past career, I did spend time down at NIAMS uh, in Bethesda, and I completely understand what you mean about all these orphans being there. You know, um, and you know, coming out of the pharma industry, absolutely. I mean, in essence, what you're describing, Richard, is sort of, you know, we talk a lot about this theme of repurposing on the show, of repurposing drugs, but you're sort of the, the sort of describing the ultimate repurposing of a procedure of a, of well, more than one procedure here. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I appreciate the way you laid that, that groundwork, well, here's a neat thing, if I can yeah, add. Sure. This book, I've been talking with a chief of staff of a U.S. congressman. He's got it. Good. He's figured it out. Yeah. So he will be distributing this book to every member of Congress and Senate this month. Yep. Now, I don't know if they'll read it, but it'll be in their hands. So maybe there will be some hopeful changes that will be beneficial coming forward. I was, a couple of things just popped to mind before we get into sort of a little bit of looking forward and thinking, you know, how can we get this done uh, at a much larger scale? How much has, I mean, there's two very interesting, oh, there's a lot of interesting stuff here, but two really interesting things. One, of course, as you're describing the fact that, you know, so the curative endpoints are not there. You know, they've never really been there for sort of traditional drugs. But you're describing something that is not just, you know, it doesn't just have this mild, mild ablative component. You are infusing new stem cells that not just reconstitute, but potentially have some unique immunomodulatory and regenerative effects as well that you may be able down the road to see some regenerative dynamics as well that lead to those curative events, which I think is a really interesting part of any of these autoimmune diseases where you, you know, whether it's the gut or the joints or the, the central nervous system that's being destroyed. At the same time, I was also thinking about, you know, we did, uh, we did an episode a couple months ago on, uh, on patient number four at the City of Hope, one of these HIV cure patients, which not the same thing, but of course, it's a case of myeloblation followed by reconstitution, followed by, hey, I don't have HIV anymore. I was just wondering how much some of those uh, HIV cure stories, which have a little bit of a, a similar background, uh, we don't normally do this, um, help or <laughs> in, in some ways with you selling this grander uh, autoimmune reversion story. So, you know, I don't work in HIV. Right. Um, Obviously, being in medicine, I'm aware sure. of it, running into people with HIV and so forth. But um, I don't work in it. I don't research in it. And um, I wouldn't be qualified to discuss that. And the reason I say that is because I see a lot of very intelligent, bright people give talks about transplant for autoimmune diseases right. in academia. But they've never done one. They don't yeah. do it. And what they're saying isn't really correct. And it's misleading. And the reason I know is because I lived this 24-7 yeah. for 30 years. And so um, the knowledge is not dangerous. It's a good thing. But limited knowledge is. Yeah. And how that comes about is when you're not 
doing it, when you're not living it, when you're totally removed from it, but you summarize it and you give all the talks and you become the speaker on it. Right. So uh, for me to go into HIV, I would have such limited knowledge that I could say something that uh, those people focused in that area would realize just right. isn't accurate. So I want to refrain from doing that. That's fine. Uh, so, um, the, you know, the best way to get the accurate is read the original papers, especially the data section. That's the best way. And then to to work in it yourself, of course, is an even better way. It's kind of like entropy. You know, the further away you get from where something was developed, the more disorganized the data and the information becomes. And the more it's like somebody telling a story to somebody to somebody to somebody that things get lost and it becomes inaccurate. So the key is to do it yourself, uh, to read the original papers, especially the data before you read the discussion or conclusion. And uh, uh, to get someone who's actually lived it, developed it, worked with it to talk about it. And again, unfortunately, because in what I've developed, which really does work right. because of the arbitrary fiefdoms and divisions, as well as these other factors and two more that I talk about in the book, uh, it's really been a hindrance to his development, right? It's tremendous success. So again, I decided finally, you know, I'm not, I did four medical textbook. I did a major one, uh, this one, 686 pages yep. that came out November uh, 21st of 2021. 140 professors, associate professors, assistant professors, universities around the world, uh, you know, virtually every continent uh, contributed uh, to this. But again, I don't think, unfortunately, that, you know, that that's going to have a big impact. So I wanted to empower patients because mm -hmm. I think this will have a big impact. I wanted uh, people who write legislation, who are involved in directing uh, big money uh, to how our system develops to be aware of this. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, I wanted the patient to be aware because for me, that's what it's all about. Ultimately, right. that's what medicine is about at the end of the day. It's helping that person in front of you. And so that's why I did this book. And so, you know, I'm really hopeful it might really be a great book and have an impact or it may just be like everything else I write, nothing changes. No. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but I've kind of done all I can do. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand. Uh, no, it's it's um, no. It, it, you're as I said. You're on one hand, you're dealing with something that's quite cutting edge. On the other hand, you know you, you've outlined the the pitfalls around it. Um, how about the um, you know obviously you know you. Well, you, you're brought to you, you have a lot of prominence <laughs> across this space, but uh, you know, a couple of years ago, obviously, the this all the stuff with the with uh, Selma Blair uh, and her particular case was uh, you know put the spotlight on you. Um, and you know, I think it's you know one of the things, uh, the other thing that when we talk about sort of the stem cell space in general is this whole area of uh, of patient funded trials and, and all that and in the sense that you were mentioning that this uh when you put some of these therapies together it does get expensive but if there are those out there that do have the ability to afford it uh in this context of of a medical procedure you know why not um what's sort of what do you what's the feel for you in terms of the current environment in terms of this because i know you know the stem cell space in general whether it's reconstitution or some of the newer things uh, that you know people are you know doing or, you know trying to go offshore for or whatever um it, it always comes with that little bit of baggage it's like oh patient's paying for it so thus it must not, you know talk, talk a little bit about that side because i personally i've never had a problem with that if, if there is someone with the money that is willing to go through informed consent to do something cutting edge you know why not uh especially if the system isn't set up to do it Talk about that part of it a bit, if you would. Right. So, um, again, there's been so much confusion in that. First of all, the vast majority of patients' insurance pays for it. Good. There are a few where it doesn't, or the people don't have the patients for the insurance, and they they have the resources, they'll pay up front. And, of course, people that have come from overseas, they don't have American insurance, so they either have their system over their pay or they pay. Mm -hmm. uh, but for most Americans, insurance does pay. Now, 
to get insurance to pay though, it can take many months, six, eight, 10 months. And it's yeah. a going to them and going, filing the appeals and working with them and getting them the information. The key, the key with insurance is to get a person or a committee that accepts responsibility for that patient in their decision yeah. and seeing that person as an individual. If you can do that, it usually works. If you deal with a large government organization where nobody accepts that responsibility, it doesn't work. So what happened with the development of the Affordable Care Act, there's nobody to talk to. So mm -hmm. we could never get approval. It just stopped. Mm -hmm. We used to get approval for, for, for Medicaid, state run, all the time. Mm -hmm. And then when Affordable Care Act came out, they, my patients started telling me they were being flipped from uh, Medicaid to the Affordable Care Act without them knowing. They were just notified. And then Affordable Care Act refused to pay for this. Just And there was no one you could talk to. So, uh, you know, it used to be, before Fair Affordable Care Act, it's the unintended consequences of good intentions. But before that, that Medicaid would pay. So we could treat people that had absolutely no job, no money. And Medicaid would pay at an amount that the hospital would lose money. But for me, I... My goal is just to help the people, not the right. money. And uh, fortunately, the hospital, uh, you know, would would take uh, Medicaid. So um, we really were able to to help the poor and the homeless. And in my book, I talk about all types of people: a billionaire that I treated, a homeless person I treated, mm -hmm. people from overseas, United Arab Emirates, India, the UK where they couldn't get this therapy there. I talked about all types of Americans, whether there was someone in the Special Forces, a Green Beret, a uh, Commodore of eight battleships that he commanded in the Pacific, uh, a housewife, a lawyer, a pilot, you know, doctor, uh, a businessman, an employee, everybody. And the key is is fighting for it. Where, where they would fall between the gaps isn't people who had nothing who were on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, it was now that they got to Obamacare, there are problems there. Got it's it. all changed. The, it's the working poor who had insurance but not good insurance. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where we'd have problems. And believe me, I would have done it for free because there's nothing out of this. Almost all the cost is hospital. It's not physician fees. Mm. Uh, but of course, no hospital is going to let you do it for free. Uh, but because at our end, there's no profit. It's not a typical drug company study. Right. So at the end of the day, we don't get a license. We don't get profit from other people doing this. All the drugs we use have no longer have patents. Their patent yeah. expired. And as a physician, this is what people are missing out there. As a physician, you have the right to treat someone with a medication Yep. Provided you're using it at a dose that's available in the literature, that's already been shown in the literature, and that you're not seeking a new indication for it. Right. And people do that all the time. For instance, in autoimmune disease, I see it all the time when I was doing oncology in a separate life, a separate century ago, <laughs> literally was the last century. Uh, you know, we would use medications all the time uh, that didn't have an FDA approval for that reason. Sure. Uh, but we would use them. And to, if you don't, people are, would be dying all the time. Sure. For autoimmune diseases, cyclophosphamide, a very common drug, oh, yeah. virtually every autoimmune disease has no FDA approval for that indication. And it has no patent. It's such yeah. an old drug. Steroids. Yeah, old. People use steroids all the time for every autoimmune disease virtually. Yep. There's no FDA approved indication for it and no drug company will ask for it. And the reason is because they can't patent it. Yeah. If they can't patent it, all the money they would put in wouldn't work. Sure. So we do it to take care of patients all the time. All I did was take these drugs at doses we've used all the time, like in leukemia or autoimmune or aplastic anemia. It, actually, transplant for aplastic anemia has been going on since the 60s, and that's an autoimmune disease yeah. in almost all cases. In a few, it's Chernobyl radiation or something, but in most people, it's an autoimmune. Right. And transplant worked. So, uh, but the problem is, uh, you know, people in hematology didn't think, well, if it works in this autoimmune disease, let's try MS. And people neurologists weren't really aware it's being used in autoimmune disease, so the connection wasn't being made. 
So it's really making that connection from something and drugs that have been used. The standard drugs for the transplant of aplast anemia is ATG and cyclophosphamide. And none of those have patents. And that those are two of the very common drugs that are both non-myeloblative that I use in, in my regimens for autoimmune disease. But unlike a drug company where you have to pay for it to, to be done, any trial, at the end of the day, you get all this money back when it's shown to work because you have a monopoly. That's what a right. patent is, it's a monopoly, and you set the price. Whereas we get nothing back in return. Mm -hmm. We're just doing this to help society. So yes, it is up to the insurance companies to pay. And most of the time, if you, you fight with them, you, they will. Or unfortunately, if they don't, it's the family of those patients that come through to have it done. But it's a structure that I live within. But people not understanding the details tweak it to think you're doing something right. not appropriate and you're charging people money. Yeah. No, in fact, as a physician, my salary is much lower than most <laughs> because I'm focused on doing this, not generating revenue. Yeah. So uh, actually, that's one of the other four topics I bring out as what's hindering this field. But what I call it is financial toxicity. Okay. And w w I bring it out in, for instance, MS. So the interferons first became available for MS in the 1990s, 1994. They cost $9,000 a year. They, as of 2020, they cost $100,000 a year. <laughs> no, yep. What happened? Well, what yeah. happened is every new drug came out. Now there's a whole bunch of new drugs. There's like 14 different ones. One just or two just came out last year again. The new drugs would go up in price. As they did, the former drugs would match that price. Yeah. And so the new drugs are running 100,000 a year and all the old drugs match it, roughly. They're running 80 to 110,000, 120,000 a year. So um, now that's what I call financial toxicity. Sure. The only drug that's fallen off the scale is Copaxone because Copaxone lost its patent okay. and it became generic and its price dropped 60% very rapidly over two years. That 60% is probably the true cost today, that 60% fall in price of manufacturing, distributing and making profit on the drug. Right. But the reason these other drugs are high, you, you know, I'm not against patents, I'm not against drug companies. They invest a lot of money. If it succeeds, they need that breathing space to sure. make that money back. Yep. To do that process, FDA regulations, if you ever read, you know, the Code of Federal Regulations like Title 21, if you ever read the International Code of Harmonization, my goodness, those rules have become so complicated, so strict. It costs so much money and it's minutia of detail. It's paperwork that has to be done. And that's one of the reasons, although you need oversight, it's one of the reasons why drug costs go up. Drug companies then want more in return when they succeed, because if they don't succeed, they, they lose a lot of money. But anyway, when the patent goes off, the price is dropped markedly. We're using non-patented drugs. So, you know, there was, and we're doing something that at the end of the day, no investor, including me myself, get anything out of. We're just being good doctors. We're doing, doing what is true academic medicine. So I bring out in here another example. Because it's not just in transplant where this happens. Rituximab, a drug against B cells, was found by neurologists to help in MS. Yep. Pretty good. And they started using it and they started writing papers about it. But the FDA never approved it for that. The drug company that made Rituximab, which got a patent to use it for ALL and some cancer indications, the patents expired. So they were not interested in looking at a study for MS. Why should they? Someone else will make a generic Rituximab and they're not going to get anything out of it. So long and behold, a guy came along or a group of people and they uh, came up with another antibody that targets B cell, the exact same CD antigen on B cells as rituximab and they call it Ocrevus, Ocrelizumab. And they did a study and they found it worked, they got FDA approval. And so that Ocrelizumab costs $40,000 an infusion. The way it's given, you get one infusion, two weeks later, another 40,000, so that's 80,000, then at three months and then you know, they can vary. It's usually every six months you're giving an infusion, lots of money. Mm -hmm. Rituximab was dirt cheap because it's lost the patent. But as soon as Ocrevus came out, every neurologist switched from using Rituximab to Ocrevus. Nobody uses it anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody ever did a study comparing Rituximab to Ocrevus, I am 
my gut instinct, everything tells me the efficacy will be the same. They're targeting that same antigen on the B cell. But the right. rituximab, because there's no patent on it and it's much cheaper, it's going to be much cheaper. The Ocreve is going to be much more expensive, but nobody in this current environment will ever do that because no drug company has an interest in that and nobody out there in taking care of patients is going to do it. They get nothing out of it. And it's not going to be better than Ocrevus. It's not going to be worse. They're just going to show it's much cheaper. So nobody does it. Mm -hmm. That's financial toxicity. Right. So one of the things I bring out is that we need to tweak our system yep. where doctors are taught in their training that not only are they through their Hippocratic oath and through their education need to do the best medically for a patient, but also financially. Right. Because doctors have no concept of the cost to patients or to the insurance company. So we're trained as professionals and medicine is a profession, but healthcare is a business and doctors don't understand that business. And now a lot of doctors are becoming employees of hospitals. They're being pushed and at the end of the year, given a bonus for their RBUs for the more they bill. So doctors are not understanding it. When big journals, whether it's New England Journal or JAMA or Lancet or whatever, publish clinical data, they never talk about cost effectiveness. Yep. It's, and nobody criticizes them for it. And mostly they don't talk about quality of life. That's starting to change. But a lot of these are published without quality of life. All these big drug company trials, they don't publish quality of life in yeah. MS. You'll find some later publication like Tysabri, they put all their trials together and they report it because there's a one point improvement, but you know, that's of no meaning. So they don't, if you're going to do, when you come to a phase three randomized trial, if you could tweak it, so you mandate quality of life, you show that all this expense and everything, quality of life gets better as a, as a big outcome. And then cost effectively compared to other therapies out there and reward physicians and patients for being aware and controlling the cost of healthcare. So as I bring out in the last part of the book, you know, medicine and the business of medicine, healthcare is so complex. You know, how do you make tweaks? How do you change it so it's constructive? Well, I think we begin with kind of a general recognition in society that we want healthcare to be advanced, to be affordable, to be accountable, and to be all inclusive. And I call that the four A's. Let's begin there. And then how, how do you achieve that? Well, those, those goals contradict each other. Very mm -hmm. advanced healthcare requires a lot of money, a lot of expense. It's not affordable. And then right. it limits its distribution to everybody, so it's not all-inclusive. All-inclusive limits giving the best to everybody. So how do you balance this? One of the ways to do it is set in checks and balances. And if, if physicians are independent, not employees, so that some institute or whether it's private or public is making money off the physician's work and telling them just to go get it and they don't know what's being charged, what's coming in, but our independent employees, and if we correct this labyrinthine billing system that exists out there, it's like a nightmare of billing and simplify it, and then give physicians as independent professionals, not employees, but as professionals, the understanding that they're not only there for the medical care of their patients, but the financial. Because if a patient can't afford it, that financial toxicity seriously impacts their medical health and their psychological health. So it's just as important. So that's another one of the key things of the four that I bring out in the last chapter. Now, again, it sounds like I'm talking about health healthcare policy. I'm really not. What I brought out in the last chapter is to explain why this doesn't take off despite its great success right. and great number of misunderstandings that are out there. You're very intelligent. You're saying what everybody says. I've lived it. I know this is being twisted. So it's not being understood correctly. Right. And it's because of the system that we're just accepting and going forward with that, you know, there's if, in other words, no drug company is going to compare their drug to the very best drug out there. Right. Not get approval. Not it compare, compare it to nothing or to weak <laughs> non inferiority. I've seen too so much that's of that. What's happened. When you look at these these trials in MS, they compared it to nothing and now they compare it yeah. to the weakest, which is interferon and copaxone. Yeah. They don't compare it to the best out there. No. Well, that would be crazy. Yeah. And you know, I want uh, all drugs have different toxicities, people react differently. So you want physicians to have an array of drugs to be able to use. Sure. But 
the physicians could come in and say, well, we're going to compare Ocrevus to Rituximab. No longer has a patent, let's do it. But there's no incentive to do it. There's no right. reward. And, you know, so it's not done. So what I did is took not one, but a group, two, three, four non-patent drugs, put them together with a different concept to reset the immune system, not suppress it. And lo and behold, it really works great. And then I bring out cost effectiveness. So now types of transplants vary, whether they're non-myeloblative in costs, whether they're non-myeloblative or, or myeloblative. With the non-myeloblative way I do it in MS, it's like $100,000. And the hospital still makes money. Yeah. But when you look, that's one year of drug therapy, even if it's an interferon. Oh, yeah. One year. And yet we're showing that 75% of people remain drug-free for five years, and it appears now that I'm just randomly contacting these people, and every one of them still in remission 10 to 20 years out, that this is a tremendous cost savings. And I wrote a paper and I published it. I had a lot of trouble getting that published. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wanted to publish it. I finally got it published, you know. Uh -huh. And I did the same. I wrote a paper on CIDP, chronic inflammatory myeloid neuropathy. The standard of care is IDIG. That is so expensive. People pay yeah. 12000 a month for insurance companies. And believe me, insurance companies don't want to pay it. They stop. The patient has to find the money themselves. Yeah. Or they crash and they can't move anymore and the insurance company is forced to pay it again. So transplant, now the way I do CIDP is 125000 instead of 100000 a little more expensive. But that's a tremendous cost savings. I mean, in some people that were, we, I took a patient transplant getting IVIG five days a week, the next week, four days a week, and that continued forever. I mean, that was, he was spending that much money in six weeks. Yep. So, you know, the transplant was a tremendous savings to health insurance, but physicians aren't thinking that way. It's like, there's so many examples of that, but let's say you take your car to a mechanic and, um, uh, you know, he has no idea what the cost of anything is, so he just puts in multiple things uh, that are the most expensive and newest. You get this gigantic bill. Well, you're not going to accept that. No. But in medicine, that's what's going on. And it's because physicians are totally unaware of the cost or the impact of those charges on that individual patient or on society. And the patients themselves are unaware. And that's an anachronism that needs to change. Yep. And uh, if if that changed, people would be viewing what I'm doing as really making great sense. And why haven't been people been doing this? So it's not that anybody means harm. It's the way our system's gotten structured. And once you get this giant system going that's self-invested, mm -hmm. it's really hard to wake people up to change for what our goal is. Our goal and why the system exists, how it started, and it's grown and grown and grown, is for the patient in front of us. And that's what I bring out in this book that, you know, there's kind of many themes in there that uh, hopefully people will, will pick up as they read through it. But, uh, and hopefully it'll have a bigger impact beyond just these diseases. In, in fact, um, on the back cover, we have uh, some endorsements and one of the people endorsed it is the uh, president of, or former president of Northwestern University, uh, he says, the author's fascinating journey takes us in our own discovery of humanity and medical and healthcare systems and structures for advancing knowledge in healthcare. Dr. Bird has a unique voice and powerful stories to tell. So this could help people beyond converting this chronic disease into a one-time uh, reversible illness into our entire healthcare system and how we approach it. Uh, because I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think this money going in this system is going to be sustainable. And if you don't have top quality health care, you're getting stuck with these incredible bills that are shocking. So something has to has to change here. And this is uh, uh, it's also then what hinders the development of this field. Yeah, it's um, and I think, you know, as you say, and if everyone's going to be reading the book, stories uh our way to get that done and i think you know the way you're describing it and i i look forward to, to having my copy um you know really seeing the human side of it as you said that this is you know a lot of this pharma biotech stuff is just over everybody's head but at the end of the day as you point if it can come back better outcomes quality of life 
and a, a pharmaco healthcare economic story as well. I think uh, and, you're definitely on the right path there. I'm absolutely not against uh, farm, uh, big big farm, not at Me all. Either. Me either. They have their role. They have their purpose. Yeah. What I'm saying is the system's dropping the ball. There's yeah. no counterbalance. There's no checks and balance. Right. And uh, I offer some suggestions how to do that. Uh, and um, that's why I also want to do these podcasts is I want this information to get out there. I want people to read this. And I want the lay public to read it because there's so much confusion, so much misinformation, sometimes even personal. When you do such good things and you get these personal kind of misinformation by bloggers and stuff, you're like, wow, what's going on? But it's it's because people have limited knowledge. They're yeah. not living it. I lived it. And as I lived it, and people would say, why aren't people screaming about this at rooftops to get it? And I started thinking why that is. Yeah. And so it's king. It's not, you, you know, as in all walks of life, there's politics. There's some people that are vengeful and there's all these things. But what's holding this back is not a personality. It's a structured system that's meant to do well. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you have to change things as time go on to make sure it does well. Yeah. That's what this, this brings out. Richard, what... Um... Just while I have you, I mean, what? How'd you get the Dalai Lama to uh, to write the four? What do you, you call him up out of the blue? Uh, give us a couple minutes on what that story is all about. Well, thank you for for asking, but you know, I'm not qualified. I'm not in the stratosphere where the Dalai Lama is, and so I would have to let him answer that. Okay, that's a question you have to ask him. Uh, it's just that. Uh, you know, I, I hold him in a in a in a place of respect, and so I I don't have that same qualification. No problem, no problem. I just I said I want to point that his, out. Uh, his forward is beautiful, yeah. and I hope people read it. Outstanding, <laughs> Richard. I'm. Um... By the way, I end the book. So I start the book with with uh, forward by the Dalai Lama. I end it with a quote by the Dalai Lama. Nice, so, nice. <laughs> Well, you know, as I said at the beginning, Richard, I've, I've been following you for a while now. I'm a, I'm a big fan, and I'll continue to root you on, especially in, uh, as you spread this message and as you educate and 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 tell these stories about uh, these possibilities. And and you know, again, we 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 see so much, uh, but as you said, there are little blips in the press about this drug or that new medical device. But, you know, here you have something that works, uh, the impact across literally hundreds of millions of people suffering from these diseases um, and really wishing the best with all of it. Uh, for everybody, again, that's going to be listening to this particular episode uh, of our podcast uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to Dr. Richard Burt, Fulbright Scholar, Professor of Medicine, Scripps Healthcare, Retired Professor of Medicine, Northwestern University, CEO of Janani Biotechnology. Pick up the copy of his new book, available tomorrow on all outlets, Everyday Miracles, Curing Multiple Sclerosis, Scleroderma, and Autoimmune Diseases by Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplants. Uh, Richard, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us for a little while. Uh, thanks, obviously, for everything you've been doing throughout your career. And uh, as we like to say on our show here, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via everything you're doing. A really great story. Thank you.